Plants often become unwanted plants when they're especially prolific. Celandine is one such plant, quickly spreading to fill an area with its glossy green leaves and dizzyingly bright yellow flowers. But celandine is also a bit of a confusing plant, since the greater celandine and the lesser celandine are not related. The greater celandine, or Chelidonia majus, is actually a member of the poppy family, while the lesser celandine, or Ranunculus ficaria, is actually in the buttercup family. You can actually tell the two plants apart because lesser celandine flowers between roughly January and April and greater celandine flowers between May and August, even as late as October. You can find lesser celandine in damp shady woodland and greater celandine prefers grassland and garden borders. Yet both of them appear in quite specific medical remedies, so we're going to jump into the folklore of celandine in this episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. We are continuing to have a look at the folklore of unwanted plants, so we're just going to jump straight into celandine. Now, like I said in the introduction, we are going to have a look at the folklore and remedy-related stuff of both the greater and lesser celandine varieties, because there is a little bit of overlap, even though they're from completely different families. And please remember this episode covers folklore, so don't try any of these remedies because this episode does not constitute medical advice. If you do want to learn herbalism, as always, I highly recommend you take one of the courses from Rowan and Sage and learn herbalism from someone who really knows what they're talking about. But anyway, we're going to jump into Greater Celandine, and this is actually considered an invasive weed, although it does actually have its uses for pollinators in wildlife gardens. And because it flowers into late summer, it does continue to provide a food source as late as October in some places. Now in folklore, Greater Celandine could cure depression and raise the spirits if worn. Witches, on the other hand, might carry greater celandine in a red bag around their necks to avoid being detected or imprisoned. And at the same time, if you scrubbed your floor with celandine infused water or burned the plant as incense, it could drive witches away. And this is another one of those examples of both sides of an argument using the same plant. Now elsewhere, greater celandine also had associations with legal matters and wearing greater celandine against the skin could help you to avoid unwarranted imprisonment. And you just had to be sure you replaced it every three days. People could also wear the plant to a court hearing to improve their prospects with the judge and jury. And these legal associations definitely seem stronger in the US, whereas in the UK it does seem to lean a lot more heavily towards keeping away witches or witches keeping away accusers. Now we're going to have a look at some of the remedies now. And we talked last week about how dandelions could be used to remove warts. And greater celandine is also apparently helpful for doing so. And law directed people to pull up a celandine plant at midnight They should then bury the plant and then dig it up again three days later. I'm not 100% sure why, but there we go. And having dug up the plant, they could then squeeze the juice over the wart. Now, that is perhaps a little bit more fiddly than the other more popular remedy in which you cut either an apple or a potato in half and then you rubbed both pieces on the wart. Then you put the two halves back together, bound the whole apple or potato with string and buried it. And in this particular remedy, the wart would apparently disappear as the item rotted. The chances of that happening really, I think, are actually quite small just because of the way that warts form and what causes them. Whereas the idea of using the greater celandine seems to rely on the sap itself. Now, people called the plant wartweed, killwort and wartflower due to this belief that it could cure warts. And it seems to be the bright sap from the stalk, which the Royal Horticultural Society actually describes as orange latex, that seems to do the job. Although the RHS also point out that the sap can be an irritant, which probably explains why if you put it on a wart, it may seem to get rid of it. Now, according to recollections on plantlaw.com, Lots of people believed that greater celandine had wart-busting properties, and one woman grew up on a farm and her father actually grew the plant specifically to treat warts and verrucas. It does also appear in various eye-related remedies, and Pliny, that friend of fabulous folklore, claimed greater celandine was also called swallow wart because swallows fed their baby celandine to improve their eyesight. And other people also believed that swallows would actually feed their baby celandine if their babies were blind somehow the plant would give them back their eyes or something. 
Now, incidentally, those on plantlord.com actually reported that greater celandine did actually help with eye ailments. One respondent in 2012 said bathing the eyes with an infusion of greater celandine leaves and flowers could reduce cataracts. And a respondent in 2004 said passing the juice from the leaves over the eyelids treated eye problems. Again, don't try this at home. Now, Old English medical tomes also recommend using the plant for eye issues. And in one of them, it actually recommends warming an infusion of greater celandine with honey in a copper pot and then using that as an eye salve. Now, Pliny might not have been wholly wrong in calling the plant swallowwort, although the reasoning behind it was a little bit iffy, because some people actually said that the swallows return when the celandine blooms, hence its name. Now, that would place the return of the bird in February, and that's actually the lesser celandine, not the greater celandine. So it's one of those kind of things where there's that many different bits of law about these two plants knocking around that sometimes they do overlap. Because in this case, the Greek word for swallow was chelidon, and celandine is believed to be the anglicised form of chelidon, and obviously greater celandine is chelidonium magus. So it's more likely that it's referring to the greater celandine as being swallowwort than lesser celandine. Now, people also believed that the greater celandine could actually cure jaundice, and this is based on the doctrine of signatures that I've mentioned a few times now, because it does become quite important where plants are concerned, that people believed that God had left his signature on plants as to what that plant was supposed to be for. So the really famous example is lungwort, because you've got these dotted leaves which were believed to represent diseased lungs and therefore they thought that the plant could then help hence the reason it's called pulmonaria you also have the fact that people believe that because walnuts look like brains that walnuts could help brain ailments now walnuts technically do actually contain minerals and vitamins and whatnot that are really useful for the brain so in that case they were kind of onto something albeit perhaps for maybe the wrong reason now with greater celandine because the plant was so yellow or at least the flowers were it was believed to cure jaundice because that turns the skin yellow and I couldn't really find much law to back that up so I don't really know how they used it to help cure jaundice. It's just a belief that Margaret Baker repeats so I'm not really sure how widespread that particular belief was. Now that's the greater celandine. We're going to move on to the lesser celandine and this one appears in the spring as well and provides nectar for early pollinators, particularly queen bumblebees. It's got heart-shaped leaves and bright yellow flowers on quite long stalks. And where the greater celandine actually grows quite tall, the lesser celandine tends to form mats at ground level. So where I live, for example, there's a little patch of it in one of the grass verges beside a roadside. And then there's also a huge mat of it down by one of the streams near my house. So it's one of those kind of things where it appears in quite damp places, ideally, but it also just kind of pops up pretty much wherever it can get a, a foothold in. Now, some do consider it a weed because it spreads so quickly and it is a British native plant and you will often find it in woodland areas or beside streams. And in the US, the lesser celandine is classified as invasive in several states and it is considered toxic to grazing livestock. Now, the young leaves of the lesser celandine are apparently edible for humans, sometimes used as salad leaves because apparently they're high in vitamin C and people in Germany used to use them to treat scurvy, which could explain its alternative name of scurvy herb. But as always, do not eat any plants you find unless you know 100% what you're picking and how to prepare them. Now, William Wordsworth actually wrote the poems The Small Celandine to the Same Flower and to the Small Celandine about Lesser Celandine. So keen was he on this particular plant. Now, they're also the plant that actually covers the ground in all directions when spring returns to Narnia in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. So it just goes to show how synonymous Lesser Celandine is with spring but it does also reference how fast it spreads. Now, in folklore, people called the lesser celandine goldy knob, golden guineas, or filding cup due to its bright yellow colour. And in the US, it's sometimes referred to as the fig buttercup. Now, because of this relationship between celandines and buttercups, children used to use the, the flowers from the lesser celandine in pretty much the same way, where you would hold the flower under your chin, and if it reflected yellow on your skin, it meant that you liked butter. I'm not massively sure why that was an important thing to divine with flowers and I would imagine you would probably already know if you like butter or not but to be fair it does make a bit of a change from the usual love divination that Fabulous Folklore covers and I'm sure we've all done that as kids usually with buttercups because they're a little bit easier to come by I think but it is quite a common thing that even I remember doing as a child. 
Now, Lesser Celandine also had legal matters, joy, protection and happiness as its symbolic meanings. Although I do have to wonder how much the legal matters are actually those associated with the greater Celandine that's then just been imported across. Because some people just refer to Celandine as this blanket term, which doesn't really specify which family you're talking about. But there again, I did mention divination and much like dandelions, the flowers do close before rain arrives. So people did also use them to try to predict the weather. Now, if Greater Celandine was ideal for treating warts, then Lesser Celandine had its own uses, and its alternative name of Pilewort will give you a few clues as to what they were. Now, a plantlord.com respondent in 2004 suggested that cooking the combs of Lesser Celandine with lard would help to cure piles. I'm assuming that you would apply the mixture to get the effects of it. And meanwhile, a respondent in 2001 said she'd heard of a friend's father using the petals from the flower in lard to make an ointment. The man didn't tell the respondent where he actually put the ointment, so we can only assume it was to cure piles. Now, this again comes from the Doctrine of Signatures, and because the root of the Lesser Celandine apparently looks like a hemorrhoid, people therefore assumed that the plant could cure piles. So ultimately, what do we actually make of celandine? Well, despite being in two different plant families, celandine as a flower does actually look somewhat similar in terms of the colour and the actual shape of the flower as well. Now, it does seem that our forebears didn't confuse it because the law is quite specific about the uses of each plant. And it seems to be more recent books that then just lump both types of plant together and then mix them up where I've tried to keep them separate. Now, it is fascinating that both plants appear as remedies before anything else, although I do think that Greater Celandine's use to ward off witches or win legal battles does give it like the folklore edge, as it were. But neither plant possesses much law in the way of divination, suggesting that this was a plant used medicinally rather than magically. Of course, they both also have their uses for pollinators, and you've probably noticed that I harp on about that quite, on, quite a lot, because bees in particular are so important just as part of the ecosystem. But the prolific growth of both plants does make that they can be a bit of a nightmare for gardeners. Luckily, they do thrive in wild areas where they can at least continue to feed bees and other insects. And in the case of Lesser Celandine in particular, because it quite likes shady areas, it does mean that it at least thrives in areas where other plants might not. So at least it does have a use. Now, what I want to know is, do you know of any other folklore about celandine? Because the folklore is a little bit thin compared to other plants. Have you tried any of these remedies that people have talked about? Or is it a particularly awful plant where you grow? Because like I say, there's a lot about them both being invasive in the US, whereas in the UK, because they're sort of considered native, people consider it a weed, but it's not necessarily that annoying, if that makes sense. So please do feel free to let me know. I haven't decided what we're going to do next week, but part of me is really tempted to look at nettles because nettles are really quite useful in a lot of weird ways. But because of the fact that the sting people, they are then considered unwanted. And as someone who has had more than their fair share of nettle stings, I can attest to the fact that it's difficult to love them when they've just stung you. So we may have a look at nettles, but I haven't 100% decided yet. So you'll find out next week which one I've chosen. I've decided to start moving my updates to the end of the episode rather than the beginning. So if you're not really interested, you can just listen to the folklore and then do whatever you need to do with the rest of your day. But if you are interested, you can at least then listen to the end of the episode. And basically, the only thing that I've got to add this time is obviously when you're listening to this, this is Easter Saturday. So happy Easter. But also, if you are in London, I'm doing my in-person talk at the Miskatonic Institute on the 11th, which is Tuesday, where we're looking at water folklore. So we'll be looking at loads of kind of law associated with like rivers, waterfalls, lakes, ponds, estuaries, the sea, things like that. And because it is in London, obviously I am going to be putting a bit more emphasis on things to do with the Thames and London's lost rivers and so on, rather than the more northern bias that I tend to have here. But I will be looking at things like wells and stuff like that all around the country. And we will also be looking at things like Celtic water deities and how we know about them through the Romans and all that kind of thing as well. So it would be lovely to see you if that's something that you're able to attend. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening. And I'll see you next week when we'll hopefully be looking at nettles. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes 
So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.